Hello and welcome to the new shop. That's right, we are fully moved and I've got my wood shop up and operational and I'm back. So thank you for being patient with me as I've been rebuilding the uh, Watai Wood Turning uh, brand, I guess, and uh, building a workspace where I can expand, grow, and learn and add some much needed tools. So today we're gonna do something special um, there's a wedding coming up and uh, my better half asked that I make a platter to commemorate the occasion for the happy couple. I have a piece of maple that is 12 inches in diameter which will just fit uh, and I have pre-cut it and drilled it to accept a wood glue screw and so we're going to go ahead and get started on making a maple wedding platter. Thanks for joining me. Stick around and find out about some of the new stuff we are going to have coming on what I will turn. Okay, so I still don't have a bandsaw, but what I do have is a skill saw, a Japanese pole saw, a really great craftsman crosscut saw, and a uh, Hitachi miter saw. So. I can mostly get a piece round. Uh, I've already drilled my hole in the center so that I can mount it on a woodworm screw. And what we're going to do is get this round and then make some decisions about what shape it's going to be. If you look, this is from a crotch. You can see the, uh, the branch the center of the branch coming here, and you can see feathering, which is a feature I want to try to preserve in the finished piece. This is going to be the inside of the platter. This will be the base. I have some minor cracking along here, but it's primarily, I think, surface. I don't think it's gonna have too much of an effect on us. Uh, and of course, we're gonna run into the actual core, the heartwood of the branch here, uh, this part of the crotch just kind of went out this way and this is the main trunk of the tree. Hopefully that doesn't interfere too greatly with our ability to come to a final piece. And I am pushing the outside limits of the lathe and as you see here, I've got a high spot so I'm going to have to mark that. And take it back to my saws and adjust it. Let's see if I can find any more high spots. There's one. It's always good to do this. The last thing I want to do is turn the lathe on and have these hitting and tearing my belt up. So I've got to go back to the uh, saws and adjust the edges here and just shave off of these. These are just little corners, little angles because I don't have a bandsaw so I couldn't actually cut it in a circle. Um, so it's a multi-sided polygon. And I'm going to go ahead and mark where I think I'm going to see a little bit of interference and trim all the way around. Uh, when you don't have the exact tools to do something specific, you can find ways to do it with the tools you do have. Worst case scenario is I'd sit there with my Japanese pole saw and just spend all day. Thankfully, I do have electrical powered saws and I don't have to do that. So we'll take it to the saw, adjust it, and we'll be back. All right, I want to talk a little bit about why I chose this piece of wood. Like I was explaining before, it's a piece of crotch wood. And uh, I want to show you why I chose it and why I oriented it the way I did. If you look at the grain in the side here, especially this is right in that crotch split area, you can see that there is a lot of really cool figuring going on. When you come around and this would be the, the uh, pith of the main branch of the tree, you've got that but you've got just a lot of really rich figuring, uh, some ambrosia 
going on. I don't think much spalting, but we do have ambrosia. And so when I was looking at the slab I cut this from, from the outside, and seeing the grain patterns in the surface, I thought that I might be able to find some very, very rich color and grain pattern and textures going on inside. And having cut it round and cut all these little segments off to get it to fit on the lathe, I do not think we're going to be disappointed. So one of the things that I put into consideration when I'm making something like a platter is what does the grain look like and what will the grain bring me? Um, or what is a feature that will make this stand out and be distinct? And in this one, it's going to be that feathering right through here, right through this section, which you can see some wild stuff going on on the side here because that's where the branch comes out of the main body, the pith, uh, in the crotch of the tree. So just something to think about. I also decided that I wanted the feathering to be on the inside surface. So this is the center of the tree. This is the outside, which means when we cut it away, as we're cutting towards the center, um, we'll get a really nice uh, pattern of the rings of the layers of the tree. So we'll see that a lot more as we get it round and then begin to work into the wood. Now one of the decisions I have to make is how big a foot to put on this. And uh, that's really something I'm not ready to think about until I get it round, so, or get the bottom flat. Once I get the bottom flat and we look at, like I said, there's a little bit of pith here. There's a, there's a bit of pith, so I'm probably gonna have to take about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more off and see what that looks like in here in the center of the piece because I am going to slope it up in some form or fashion so I'm not sure we'll see we got to get it flat and once it's flattened off I can make some of those kinds of decisions So I had a little bit of uh, surface rot. It wasn't really bad, but I'm getting through. I think probably if I get down to this level, I'll have, I'll have taken that, that nastiness right off of the piece. Look at this. We're starting to get into that, that uh, character from the crotch. This is the, the main trunk of the tree here. This is where the branch came out. So 
Now I think I should be able to clear that, but now I gotta think about a foot. I think I'm gonna put the big uh, the big jaws on the chuck. So I gotta start working on taping that. Okay, what we're going to do now is take this off and establish a foot. I might have to take a couple more passes. Get to see this is rot here. I definitely need to get past that. So uh, I need to sharpen my gouge and then we're going to get the middle out, establish a recess for the chuck and a foot, and then work on the shape of the back side of the bowl, of the uh, platter. So, sharp tools. about through that pithy rottenness so I can go ahead and start taking this center out. Before I get into some design elements and some shapes, as you can tell, because the top is so uneven, this piece is still moving a lot. So I'm not getting the cuts as clean or as even as I'd like. So I'm going to do something a little counterintuitive. I'm going to reverse it, flatten the top, and then flip it back over and readdress the base. That's the best solution I could figure 
since the out of balance is moving the lathe so much. To give you a little bit of a picture of why I decided to get this a little more level so that we could get the base established and everything, that's how much the lathe is walked. Of the grain, oh yeah. Get a better picture of grain here. A better picture of the cracks. And I'm going to take one more pass, and I'm going to flip it back around. And we're going to start to shape the base. This worries me right here, but we may be able to eliminate it.
So when you apply it, you start out at a slower RPM, this is around 420, and you're just working it into the wood. And then you kick it up a little bit. This is an abrasive paste. And you're just going to keep working it on a clean section of the towel. Use paper towels, do not use rags. If a rag gets caught, it could take your fingers off. It could wrap you up in the lathe. That is the last thing you want to have happen. So you can see I'm removing, uh, I'm removing wood particles. It's still getting color. You kick it up a little bit more, I'm about 800 RPM. You just progress through the RPMs and keep doing this, keep giving it a little bit of pressure, not much. And you can actually feel where you've got more grit still working. You just remove the grit. Just keep doing this until the towel comes away clean, which it is not. Now, mineral oil is a carrier in this. After you remove the grit, your uh, paper towel comes away clean. Or if you feel like you just don't have as much off as you think you, could, you should, you can clean this with uh, mineral spirits and remove any residual oil so that your finish can absorb into the piece. Now, this is just about done. That is 1100, 1200 RPM here, 1199. You can tell when the towel comes away with that. Yeah, see, that's coming away clean. There's nothing there. So at this point, because yes, there is a, a small amount of mineral oil in here, you could conceivably consider this finished. Now, the sandy paste comes also with a tongue wax, which is a combination of tongue oil, beeswax, and carnauba wax. Wow, look at that. Um, and I could put that on this. The problem is you gotta leave it on, you gotta put it on, walk away for about a half an hour or so so that the tongue oil can start to polymerize and then buff it in. I wanna reverse this and turn the inside and get to my final piece, my final shape. Brad also makes a tongue honey 
which is also a combination of tongue oil, beeswax, and carnauba wax, just in different ratios. That is an off-laid finish, and that's what I'll be putting the final finish on this with once uh, I engrave it, because this is going to be laser engraved.
Oh, wow. I definitely picked the correct piece of maple. That is stunning. There it is. Now this is going to be laser engraved specifically for its uh, recipients. It is a wedding gift. But just look at that green. What an amazing piece of wood. Now, this does not have its final finish on it. What I am going to use is Tongue Honey from Brad's Workbench. It is a uh, thinner combination of tongue oil, beeswax, and carnival wax than his tongue wax. And the reason I'm doing that is because the tongue wax finish, you put it on, you have to let it sit for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, the longer the better, and then buff it. Um, where this tongue honey, I can apply off the lathe, and uh, since I am going to engrave this, I want to apply it after I laser engrave so that I seal the surface, and then come back and wipe it off later, and then I will put it on a buffing wheel with straight carnival wax. So there you have it. It's great to be back in the shop, and uh, it's really fun to be able to put together a piece as, as gorgeous as this. This is just, the grain in here is absolutely incredible. I will be uh, doing some more videos. I hopefully get back onto a weekly schedule. So thank you very much for being patient while I bought a shop with a four bedroom house out front. But a shop. And uh, as the shop grows and I add equipment and I add the, the things, the kinds of things that I build, I will include those in the videos. So thank you again for all your support. And don't forget to check out the brand new t shirt design at wataiwoodturning.com. I am working in conjunction with Nathan, uh, Whiskey Badger, Nathan at Whiskey Badger Design, another veteran-owned business. He is did, did the design and he's doing the printing of my t-shirts and shipping um, for my new design t-shirts. So please check that out. If you like what you see, if you support the channel, you can do so by buying t-shirts. Thank you once again for joining me. And remember, just one more pass means put the bowl gouge down. Thank <laughs> you.